Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the Frobenius endomorphism. Okay, so the first thing I want to do in this second video is finish the proof that the Frobenius endomorphism is indeed a ring homomorphism, i.e. that it's a ring endomorphism. Okay, right, uh, so we did additive compatibility, next up is multiplicative compatibility, and uh, hopefully you will be able to work out the proof of this yourself and will realize uh, that it's very, very trivial. Okay, it just follows from the fact that our ring is commutative. Okay, so we need to prove then for all A and B uh, that you can possibly dream up from the ring capital R that if you firstly multiply them together and then map, it's the same answer as if you map and then multiply. Okay, so phi of A times B is equal to phi of A times phi of b. Okay, so we want to check that this is true. So let's firstly apply phi to a times b. So let's work out the left hand side here. So we're just going to get a times b to the power of p here. And if we work out the uh, right hand side here, what we get is a to the power of p is phi of a, and b to the power of p is phi of b. So we're just applying the very definitions of the Frobenius endomorphism here. Okay, so why is it the case then that these two things are equal to one another? Well, of course, all this means is a times b times itself p times. So, excuse me, you can imagine putting a times b here in a row p times, all multiplied together in a row like so, p times. You've got p lots of a times b here. Okay, and of course, because of commutativity of multiplication in our ring, capital R, okay, what we can do is move all the A's together and move all the B's together, so indeed we can quite easily rewrite this as A to the power of P, A multiplied by itself P times, times B to the power of P, B multiplied by itself P times. So multiplicative compatibility is very trivial for the Frobenius endomorphism here. Okay, so excellent. One final thing then that we need to prove is that the multiplicative identity of the domain ring is carried to the multiplicative identity in the codomain ring, i.e. that the Frobenius endomorphism does not change the multiplicative identity. It maps the multiplicative identity onto the multiplicative identity. Well, of course, this is going to be true. Just applying the definition, this is 1 to the power of p. 1 multiplied by itself is just 1, so multiply 1 by itself as many times as you like you're still just going to get 1, so you can instantly conclude that the Frobenius endomorphism doesn't change 1. Okay, and that is all three of the axioms then of a ring homomorphism checked and satisfied. So indeed, this map from R to itself is going to be a ring homomorphism, and therefore because it's uh, from itself onto itself a ring endomorphism. Okay, and I must stress that in order to prove additive compatibility, we relied on not only commutativity of the ring, but also the fact that the characteristic of the ring was this prime natural number, and that the Frobenius endomorphism was defined with this special prime natural number. Okay, we could not have had additive compatibility without those two things. Okay, so... We have now proven then that the Frobenius endomorphism is indeed uh, a ring endomorphism that you can define on any commutative ring of characteristic a prime natural number. Okay, so what I want to do now in the second part of this video is talk about the Frobenius endomorphism on a specific type of very beautiful commutative rings with characteristic P, namely fields with characteristic a prime. Okay, so I'll go over onto the other side and then begin this discussion. Okay, so we're going to upgrade our commutative ring, which has characteristic a prime natural number, to now, let's say, it's a field. Now remember, a field is a non-zero commutative ring, which has the property that all uh, non- additive identity elements have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so a very, very nice uh, commutative ring then. Okay, and we're going to assume that we are working with a field that has characteristic a prime natural number. Now, because a field is automatically an integral domain, all fields are integral domains, if they satisfy the field property, you can prove instantly that they satisfy the integral domain property. But that's very easy to do. Um, so, because of the theorem that we saw in the previous video in this playlist on the characteristic of a ring, we know that the characteristic of any integral domain is always going to be either zero or a 
prime natural number. Okay, so let's suppose that we are indeed working with a field that has characteristic a prime natural number rather than zero. Okay, so we can now consider the Frobenius endomorphism because this is indeed a commutative ring which satisfies the condition that its characteristic is a prime natural number, so we can define the Frobenius endomorphism on it. So we can have this Frobenius endomorphism, which is going to be a mapping from F to itself, and it will be defined in exactly the way that we have now studied. It will take any element of the field and it will map it onto A to the power of P. Okay, so this is all looking good. Now, why am I bothering to talk about this? Well, something really nice happens when we're talking about specifically the Frobenius endomorphism on a field, and that is that we can instantly conclude that it's an injective map. Okay, so you can instantly conclude, whereas you couldn't previously, that this ring endomorphism is an injective ring endomorphism. Okay, i.e. that all the elements in the codomain here that do have something being mapped onto them. Again, we can't necessarily conclude yet that it's subjective, although I will make a comment about that in a moment. So all the elements in the image of the um, Frobenius endomorphism here are going to have only one element in the domain being mapped onto them. You can conclude that this is injective if you're working with a field. Okay, so if you've got the Frobenius endomorphism acting on a field of characteristic prime natural number, you can conclude that it's an injective ring endomorphism. So why can you conclude this? Well, this is a rather nifty little argument. Okay, this we know is a ring homomorphism, so there must be a kernel of this ring homomorphism. So consider the kernel of the Frobenius endomorphism in this case. Now, what do we know about the kernel of a ring homomorphism? Well, it must be an ideal within the domain ring. So the kernel of this Frobenius endomorphism must be an ideal within our field capital F. But what do we know about the ideal structure of a field? There are only two of them. In any field, you only have two ideals, namely the zero ideal, the ideal that contains just zero, and the unit ideal, the ideal that contains everything in the entire field. So there's only two options for what the kernel of this Frobenius endomorphism is actually going to be. It's either the zero ideal or it's the unit ideal, and I claim it can't be the unit ideal. And the reason is that if it was the unit ideal, everything would be being mapped onto zero over here. Now we know for one that the multiplicative identity is carried onto the multiplicative identity always by the Frobenius endomorphism, otherwise it wouldn't be an endomorphism, a ring endomorphism at all. So it's not carried onto the additive identity over here. Okay, 1 to the power of p is not going to give you 0. Okay, so you can instantly conclude that no, not everything is carried onto the additive identity. Hence, the kernel of the Frobenius endomorphism, if we're talking about it acting on a field, must be the 0 ideal. Okay, this is why we require it to be a field in order to make this conclusion. And we know that whenever we're talking about a ring homomorphism, and it has kernel equal to the zero ideal, then you can instantly conclude that it's an injective ring homomorphism, i.e. you do not have loads of elements in the domain being mapped onto the same element in the codomain, otherwise you'd have a non-zero uh, ideal. Okay, the fact that the zero ideal uh, is one element large, i.e. only the additive identity here is carried onto the additive identity here, means that all the other, ele well, all the other um, but if you look at all the elements that are being mapped onto a certain element here, they are just one size. Well, they're just one element large as well. Okay, so this of course follows from the first isomorphism theorem of rings. Okay, of course the fact that the image of the homomorphism is going to be isomorphic to the domain quotiented out by the kernel of the homomorphism, and if the kernel is an ideal containing only a single element, the zero ideal is the only ideal containing a single element, then you'll be quotienting the uh, domain ring up into those of cosets that just contain one element, and those will be the cosets that are uh, all mapped on to the same elements in the um, codomain ring by this ring homomorphism. Okay, so the cosets will be the elements that are all mapped onto the same element by this ring homomorphism. So indeed, what all of that ramble was about was so that we could conclude that if the kernel of the ring homomorphism was the zero ideal, uh, then 
the map is indeed injective. Okay, so because of the fact that the field only has these two ideals, we can conclude that the kernel of the homomorphism is the zero ideal, and therefore that the map is injective. Okay, so it's not many to one, it's one to one. Okay, now we can do even better. We can say that if this field is a finite field, okay, so if we are now working with a finite field, so we're working with a finite field which has characteristic equal to a prime number, then we can conclude that the Frobenius endomorphism is bijective. Okay, we already know that for an arbitrary field, even an infinite field, uh, the Frobenius endomorphism is going to be injective, but if it's a finite field, we can also claim that it has to be bijective. Okay, so how can we add subjective onto the list to get bijective then? Well, of course, if you've got an injective map between two finite sets here, okay, so we're now supposing this is a finite set and the map is injective, it has to be subjective because every element here is being carried onto a different element here is the meaning of injective. Okay, well, there's only a finite number of things here, the same number of things that you have here. So if everything here is going on to a different element here, then everything here must be used at least once, or in, indeed at, at once completely, once and only once. Okay, uh, so you can conclude that everything has to be hit here. Okay, so it is going to be subjective. So an injective map between two, um, between a set and itself, two sets of the same size that are finite, has to be uh, bijective. Uh, so the Frobenius map on a finite field of characteristic P then is going to be a bijective map. So indeed you could call it a ring, sorry, a field automorphism. Okay, so the Frobenius endomorphism becomes actually the Frobenius automorphism if you're working with a finite field. And what that means to just stretch this as far as we can possibly go in this introductory video to the Frobenius endomorphism is that if you have any element of the finite field, so if all little a is an element of the finite field, you can find its inverse in the Frobenius automorphism now, because a bijective map will have an inverse, of course. So you can conclude that there exists some element B, which is in the field, and this element is the inverse of A, i.e. if you raise B to the power of P, you'll get A. So for any A in the field, you can find some other element in the field, such that if you um, raise that element to the power of P, you get your starting element. Okay, and that's actually going to be an important fact in uh, upcoming videos in this playlist on ring theory and in other playlists, um, and it's going to be used in certain proofs. Okay, so it's important to be aware that if you're working with a finite field of characteristic P, then for any element in that field, you can find another element which, if you raise it to the power of P, gives you your initial element. Okay, and with that uh, final comment, we will end this video on the Frobenius endomorphism.